On this episode of the Star Trek Universe podcast, we are talking about Star Trek Discovery 309, Terra Firma, Part 1, right after these messages from somebody that we have no control over. Welcome to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, the podcast where you get to listen in on the continuing Star Trek conversation that two lifelong friends have been having since they were five years old. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. Dave-o. Dave-o. <laughs> I am. I crack up when you, <laughs> when you say you get to. Like, they, it's a privilege for the people tuning in. Oh. Whereas, oh, this is the thing. This is the thing that... All everyone close to us has been rolling their eyes and walking away from. <laughs> that's that's the beauty of the internet, 30 man. Years. That's the beauty of the internet. There's like websites where people just stare at feet, man. Like like I know we we we're, we're putting our, our our bullshit conversations on the internet, and mm-hmm. some people out there find that interesting, and I am ever grateful. <laughs> <laughs> and finally finding finally finding my people uh, out there, you know? And you know what? We guess what? We've been doing this one for a hundred episodes. Oh, is today the hundredth? Yep, today's the hundredth. Oh man. man, what do we what do we do? What do we do for a hundred? Just talk about discovery, man. That's yeah, what we're gonna let's do. Let's do it. Let's do what we do every <laughs> night. Let's let's uh <laughs> let's uh honor it and, and, and let it die the way it lived and let's talk about discovery. <laughs> Let it die the way it, jeez. I don't know. Let it commemorate the way it lived. I don't know. I got nothing to say. Happy 100th, man. I, I've really enjoyed it so far. Happy 100th, buddy. <laughs> Let it die. Oh my God. <laughs> I, was, I was searching for an idiom. <laughs> Instead, we just heard from an idiot. Um, <laughs> so we're talking about Terra Firma Part 1, the uh, CBS All Access <laughs> synopsis. The USS Discovery crew journeys to a mysterious planet in hopes of finding a cure for Giorgio's deteriorating condition. Stamets and Adira make a stunning breakthrough with the newly acquired burn data. Yeah, they do. They do indeed. That uh, that Kelpian, though. Yeah, I was... uh, I didn't care. What was that? Who cared? Oh, Why why was that such a big deal? What was interesting about it... Yeah, for Saru. It's interesting for Saru. That's why it's interesting. That's why when it happens, they go, call Captain Saru. And, yeah, and, and but when I'm he gets not there, Saru. No, but what's interesting <laughs> for... Oh, I'm sorry. So you have to be personally invested in everything. You, you can't get invested to the eyes of the characters. They totally built it like I was going to care. And then I didn't. Well, no. Think about this. Think about uh, what please, this means for Saru's character. Me. I love it. Um, they're the Kelpians, right? Uh, uh-huh. The only reason the Kelpians got off of their planet was because mm-hmm. of Saru and his actions in season two. Yeah. And so, like, it looks as though the Kelpians caused the burn. Hmm. So that's why he doesn't call the cap to call the Admiral to tell it to debrief him. He's like, uh, don't bother the Admiral with this for a right now let's find out more information first because it looks like saru's actions and his like curiosity and his decision to leave his own planet and then his decision to free his people uh may have led to the eventual destruction of the federation was that the was that the insinuation i mean i I thought they were caught i just thought they were like stuck in that in that nebula or whatever i i think that's true i think he's he's sad because it's he sees his people i think it's it, it all it all relates to what you were talking about earlier in the season we were talking about if they lose him this season it might be because he decides to go back and see his mm-hmm. people but like i i don't know if they don't go with this way with it i'll be kind of annoyed because like have a little self uh, you know, analysis and this you're the one who freed the Kelpians and it looks like they caused the greatest like tragic event in all of, you know, time space or whatever. Like it, it, at least that's, that's the in, insinu- insinuation in, in my mind. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause that's what they're looking. They're looking for the source of the burn. They found it and it's a, <laughs> it's a ship full of Kelpians. Yeah. I wasn't, I didn't think they were looking for the source of the burn right then. I thought they were, just trying to find out what ship was had the distress signal at the center of that of that nebula or whatever. Yeah, but that, the nebula is the source of the burn. Or That's, maybe they just got caught in it. 
Right, but that's the whole thing. They're 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 trying to discover the source of the burn, and they found mm-hmm. at the center of it a nebula, and inside there's a signal coming out, and it turns out it's this Kelpian ship. Yeah, I guess I just didn't consider that they would be the cause. I just felt like they were I mean, victims of it. I think it's I think it's still up in the air, but I think that is it, at least to me that's what uh, that's what Saru was reacting to. Saru okay. was like, "Oh crap." Did the cut and even if he yeah, doesn't, even no, if he doesn't connect it to um, himself, like even if he doesn't connect it to him, his own actions, he's yeah, it, he's still like, did a group of Kelpians destroy the Federation? Like I feel weird and conflicted, and his allegiances feel torn, and uh, so he wants that's why he's like, let's 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 investigate more before we go report this. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I, I didn't even think about that. I was just just like, oh man, that's. <laughs> Those poor Kelpians got stuck there. There is definitely that too. In my head, I was just totally like, "Oh man, they were like the first victims of the burn." I wonder who caused it. <laughs> <laughs> it never occurred to me that, like, "Oh yeah, that was them." Like, it was just, I don't know. And, and that's the thing; it may not be, but I think that's definitely like that's what they're looking for is the cause, and that's who's at the very center. But this little ship of Kelpians, and like yeah. Saru is so tied into that, uh, he, they would probably not be there if it weren't for him. Right. So I, I just think that's super interesting. Uh, okay. And, and, and the fact that he would decide not to, like, <laughs> all the protocol he loves to follow and the, how, how he hates when other people don't follow protocol, he decides not to debrief the Admiral, it seems to me, for personal reasons. Yeah. So he's kind of breaking yeah. his own rules there. That's it's all interesting stuff for him. I, I, I liked this episode for him a lot. Uh, I liked seeing the alternate version of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Giorgio, Giorgio's respect for him is shown again in this episode mm-hmm. and his respect for Giorgio, like his, his sentence is huge when he says, like, I want you to know this may be the last time we ever see each other. And I just want you to know that I've learned as much from you as I learned from prime Giorgio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's crazy. What? That's a crazy, crazy sentence. And like, he doesn't mean you're a, as good a person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would hope not. Yeah. But like the, the she has sharpened him, you know. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I liked all of that. Man, I just I'm, I I feel so bad that I didn't connect that that it might be that they may have been the cause of the burn. God, I'm slipping in my old age. <laughs> well, I think it's it, it, it's forgivable because they're they're looking for at this distress signal this episode. They don't even mention the burn this episode, but like mm. I think that's the insinuation. But I, I may be wrong. I may be reading too much into it. It may be just he's sad because it's some of his people were trapped and died on the ship. Honestly, like while I think that your explanation is is the the best way to go story wise, I'm kind of hoping they don't do it. Just because <laughs> I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like the show to be worse so I can be right. <laughs> You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, Matt. <laughs> what is the omelet in this analogy? What omelet are you building? <laughs> an omelet of correctness for myself. <laughs> it is the most delicious omelet. <laughs> for most of my life, I've been creating an omelet of failure and disappointment. <laughs> Oh man, you just gotta you just gotta embrace the pancakes of being yourself. <laughs> diabetic Matt, I can't have those pancakes. <laughs> I'm diabetic Matt. Pancakes is what got me into this mess. <laughs> <laughs> so many pancakes. <laughs> so let's see. So so yeah, I guess let's just kind of talk a little more about these other sort of side storylines um sure there's this little adira thing that happens mm-hmm. <laughs> where she solves a thing and that's all good uh, or no she she fails at solving a thing she she like doesn't reinitialize the they? whatever damn ah, i'm trying i even edit it like in my notes stop saying her um <laughs> oh matt sorry sorry it's, it's, I, I I accept responsibility, but I blame society. <laughs> Adira continues like she she makes a mistake, and she? then she talk. Not really, fuck me. 
<laughs> yes. Mm. Yes. Reveal yourself for the fake woke man you are. <laughs> I have no illusions that I'm woke in this area. I'm trying to treat people how they want to be treated. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, it's not a comfort zone for me. Yeah, no, I mean, I, hey, I mean, I'm pretty forgiving. I, uh, so many people have called me it all these years. <laughs> so Adira is upset because Gray has not appeared lately, I guess. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Um, but that, that seems very out of nowhere, that whole little extra extra scene. Just I think it's giving us context to what's going on with, uh, with that part of the situation uh, with Stamets and Adira. Yeah, I, I you know... It feels like they're kind of building a little family between Adira and uh, Stamets and Culber. For sure. And that's that's nice. Yeah. And- Absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, uh, yeah, and it led to the next thing with... Uh- uh, with the, with the Kelpians, but that's pretty right. much that's pretty much the side stories. Uh, I guess so. That's that's pretty much it. I can't yeah, really think of anything pretty, else. Uh, like once they get on the pl- once Michael and Philippa get to that planet, mm-hmm. it's it's all just her her mission and then the mirror universe. Yeah. Oh, a, a couple of little things that go on. I guess are. Uh, that scene we talked about last week, um, that was, they had the preview or whatever, where they're, they're talking about that time agent, which was pretty awesome and connecting it to the Kelvin timeline. It's it's great. I loved, I don't know how I feel about this character. What's the character's name? Who's being played by Cronenberg? I believe his name is Kovic. Kovic. Okay. Uh, oh, interesting. Interesting. That's the name of the, uh, of the main character on... Alter Carbon. It's similar to oh. it's Kovach. It's Kovach. It's on Alter Carbon. Okay. Anyway, um, I, I, I loved the. Um, there's no way to save her. There's no way to save her. And then Colber says, "A computer. Uh, what is the way to save her?" And the computer's like, "Here." And it's just really great. It's like this is a waste of time. There's no answer. And then the computer's like, "Here's an answer." <laughs> yeah, which it wasn't just the computer. It was right. The it was the uh, it's the new. Sphere data right. supercomputer. The sphere data. I can never remember sphere data. <laughs> well, saying. it's the sphere data combined with. Mo- they they talk a lot about it this episode, which I I love. I, I swear to God, every time I think about it, my brain says it's the smart ball, <laughs> and I'm like, it's not a smart ball. Don't say smart ball. I fight myself every week to not say Dude, smart ball. Just embrace the smart ball. <laughs> My hope is that now that it has escaped from my stupid, no, man. stupid lips. We've met BB-8. This is BB great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is a little smart ball. All right. So smart ball is talking, is, is connecting <laughs> all the, all the different uh, databases from the future and the past and even lost databases and all this stuff, which I, I, I liked all of that. I yes. don't. I don't see why all that isn't being disseminated to all of the ships at this point. I mean, I understand why the sphere data is not, but I don't yeah, understand no. why uh, the other data is not. I kind of get the notion that maybe not everybody knows about it. Like I, just like how they're not telling people that they're from the past or whatever that that's all classified. Oh, that makes sense. They're probably not going like. By the way, Discovery's computer. Is full of so much ancient knowledge that we should probably be worshiping it. Like, <laughs> I definitely think they they really drove that home this week. How how much this computer is now this like supercomputer that is mm-hmm. doing way more than any other computer has done in the past, and it is is like a benevolent force, it seems, but uh, Kovic questions that benevolent force, so I, I'm interested to see that. But also, earlier on in that moment, he, right before he gets proven wrong, um, there's, mm-hmm. a, uh, there's a moment where he talks about the temporal accords, and I thought yeah. it was very interesting. He says, oh, we can't fix it because of the temp. We can't send her back because of the temporal accords, which are ironclad. And I thought was that mm-hmm. was a really interesting sentence, which are ironclad. Yeah. Because something being ironclad, like in law is one thing, but actually stopping you from doing something means there's some sort of enforcement mechanism. Yeah. Which makes me think there's like some sort of time uh, cop 
or something like that, you know, some sort of time agency that's preventing them from uh, doing what they're doing or being able to travel through time. Of course it didn't work for discovery. So I don't know what that means. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. But, but at the same time uh, that made me think all that, but at the same time he also has proven wrong like seconds later. So I don't right. know. I don't know how, what to believe about Kovic. Like how smart he seemed like sort of this all knowing, um, section 31 like dude. Yeah. <laughs> and then now he's see, he, and then the, the computer like made a fool of him. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> thought that was pretty great oh yeah yeah no it, it was it was great do you do you think they're gonna there is there is a there has been conversations and look we in the news we keep hearing about how star trek 4 uh i hate calling it that i i do because i always think the, the whale no okay right 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 um the fourth uh, kelvin movie i is on hold and it seems stupid for Paramount to do that. But it doesn't if, when you look at the marketing, we, we have plenty of proof that, you know, prime, prime timeline merchandise sells, Kel, Kelvin timeline stuff does not generally. Um, which is why they've pretty much they abandoned uh their their merchandise and stuff for the uh, last two movies. So there's this idea going around that, and we've heard Kurtzman say that he firmly believes that the prime timeline should, the movies should be prime timeline and the movies and the TV shows should be in the same universe. Do you think they're merging the Kelvin timeline with the prime timeline? Mm, I don't. Do you think they will? I mean, um, I guess no. I guess I don't. What does that even mean to merge them? I don't know. Like but you, you could make, you can't really merge them. You can make a third thing, kind of yeah. like a crisis type situation. Um, right. But there, that, that would no That's longer I mean. be either type right. thing. So I, unless, unless I guess you could bring the crew, Kirk and crew, somehow into the prime timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, like maybe into the future of the prime timeline. And that could be interesting. Like what if, uh, you know, the entire crew gets jumped to like post Picard Mm -hmm. era, um, Trek and, and like even get to interact with some of those TNG members. And now they're the young whippersnappers. And like, we got their old ass TNG crew interacting with the new, you know, that I I could see a story like that. I don't think they're doing it. This is just all spitball. And I, I, I think that, if anything, we're going to, I think we've probably run a course on the Kelvin timeline and we're probably going to get, uh, you know, if we get Star Trek movies again, they'll probably just be something new and different. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious. You know, Kurtzman had a, had a big hand in creating the Kelvin timeline. They mentioned it here. It feels a little Chekhov's gun type of hmm. situation, like them bringing it up. I don't, uh, I don't think it feels Chekhov's gun because the thing about Chekhov's gun is it's a gun. Like Mm -hmm. it's a thing you see that means death and destruction. Um, And the intro, the, the the very opaque mention of the Kelvin timeline that you really have to be paying attention to catch is not a Chekhov's gun. Well, I mean, (laughs) the Kelvin timeline for some has been the death and destruction of of Star Trek. Well, uh, sure, as a franchise, sure, sure. but this is, I'm saying like no, it's not, I, you know, in, you know what I in mean. In a storytelling though. sense, it's not. It's just not as Chekhov's gun. It's not like I, I don't even think most people. I didn't catch it the first time I heard it. I was I, I did not catch it. I heard mining vessel. It didn't even dawn on me they were talking about the uh, no, what was it called? The oh shoot, the uh, alternate time, the alternate timeline created by an incursion, uh, the incursion of a. Uh, 24th century Romulan mining vessel. Yeah. I, no, I was trying to remember the name of the mining vessel. Narada. Narada. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, I want to say the Nebuchadnezzar, which is from matrix. Um, mm-hmm. and also the Bible, I guess. Um, <laughs> there's that, <laughs> there's that. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Narada. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't see it. I don't see that that's, that's their goal to combine them because I don't think you can combine them. I think you, by combining them, you destroy both of them. Oh, I agree. But I kind of somewhat wonder if they haven't already, like if there's some sort of mechanism where 
they are going to go back and like show that they already did it somehow. I wonder right. if there's going to be more timey wimey stuff, basically. Yeah, no, I mean they're definitely they <laughs> they conveniently they said this episode just be glad you missed the temporal wars, and it's like con- <laughs> yeah. conveniently uh, they skipped over those temporal wars that Enterprise let us know was going to happen, uh, uh-huh. and that is very convenient. And, and unlike him saying that these temporal accords are ironclad, this episode it's like okay, I guess they're just saying like no more time travel. It it screws things up too much. There's no way to like do it without messing up and creating new timelines and creating paradoxes. And so we're just done with time travel, I guess in Star, in, mm-hmm. in Star Trek, at least at deliberate time travel. Right. Which should probably be best narratively. Yeah, I, I agree. Time travel is narr. I love time travel movies, uh, but it's really hard to tell a continuing narrative with time travel. Yeah, that, that, I don't know. There, <laughs> I as much as I enjoy the bit and first contact where Zephram Cochran is, I feel being used as uh, some sort of allegory for Gene Roddenberry <laughs> of just you know wanting money and women right. and fame. Like I, li- I love the idea of Kovic basically speaking from Kurtzman's point of view. Where he's just like, yep, we did the time travel thing. It was just confusing. Half the people think the prime timeline isn't a thing anymore. I, we're not doing that. It's ironclad. We're not doing that anymore. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, that said, ah, it's my bread and butter. I want to see more of that anyway. I want to see alternate timelines. And I do want to see the Kelvin universe. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind. I just I think they could get John Cho. Kelvin versus Excelsior. Come on, y'all. <laughs> I just, I just think it's, I, I'm, I'm a fan of a continuous universe. So I, yeah. I like that the Kelvin universe exists. You know, it can be a, another sort of alternate universe. They could visit from time to time. I'd love to see TNG era Kelvin verse episode or something like that'd be super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, I, I, it, it I, and we've had this conversation many times. To me, it takes away narratively the, the beauty of having a connected universe is that things matter. And when you just start saying, oh, that's all alternate timeline stuff, it just things stop mattering. You know, it, they stop mattering to the overall universe, which I like. Hmm. I like a that's why I like a tight, wet, hot continuity. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree though. Like, is like I like a connected universe, but also like a multiverse. Sure. And sure. Uh, yeah, you know, like I said, that you can have a great one-off story, but yeah. like the beauty of something like Star Trek to me and 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 the MCU is, are are that they are one contiguous universe, and you can look back and say this thing that happened seven movies ago matters to this moment. Like mm-hmm. the character I'm watching now is remembering the same thing I'm remembering and not just go, maybe that happened to this guy. I don't know. It might've, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, and like I, that, that is important to me. So, yeah, man. Yeah. What else you got? Oh, well, okay. So, so I, I, I was trying to rush through these, um, secondary plots to just get into the main thing. But, uh, there are a couple more things here. I really liked the, uh, Saru didn't want to help because he says the needs of the many are need to outweigh the needs of the one, this one. Uh, but the Admiral does, and he has this great, great thing where he says crew member, uh, your crew members drowning. If you let them, your crew will never look at you this or the Federation the same again. And you will never look at yourself the same way. Yeah. I, that bought back some credibility for him with me. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's like, he says that, he, but he says I've made a lot of mistakes in my early career. You know, like I, yeah. I, I've, I've screwed this up and he says, take this from, an, some, take this from an old salt. I just, I, that's so good, man. <laughs> I that's like such it. classic Trek stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, man. I dug it. I dug it. It was, <sighs> yeah, it was good. This whole season, by the way, has felt more like traditional Star Trek than anything else we've seen in this modern era. I, you know what? I disagree. I feel like it has felt more like Deep Space Nine, which is just my heart. It's still got an overarching plot like Deep Space Nine, but I'm talking about like the episodic nature of like yeah, but one episode. I agree. I agree. Deep Space Nine is to me that is classic Trek. <laughs> oh, okay. I guess I, I don't mean necessarily TOS, but even TOS like the episodic nature of kind of what they're dealing with in each episode has felt mm-hmm. a lot more like. Uh, 
all the classic Trek, I guess. Um, they've done a much better job of making it f- each episode feel like it has an arc, which I enjoy. Yeah. Except for this one, because it's a part one. But mm-hmm. Another thing we hadn't mentioned yet is book offering to help. Um, and, and, and Saru, again, turning to protocol. Um, and then uh, says he needs to wait for his moment to shine. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I feel like Saru is screwing up in some yep. ways. Like, just deciding to always lean on protocol instead of, you know, bending the rules when they need bending, you know? Right. No, I, you take whatever intel you can get, man. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. We are, he says, we are the Federation, the United Federation of Planets. See, he, that kind of hubris doesn't do well out here, you know? Yeah, I, it, that kind of hubris doesn't ever do well in Star Trek. Quoting the line from uh, the Emerald Chain Lady last episode. Oh, I know. But, you know, to be fair. To be fair. And complete, and, no, no. Yeah. But to, to, be, to, be, to be fair, though, like... Throughout Star Trek history, the hubris of the Federation has never worked to its advantage. Oh, yeah. Whether it be, you know, a stuffy admiral getting, you know, screwed over by Kirk doing the right thing. Well, uh, you know, it's a tricky thing, though, because discovery. Like, it's that just hubris, through. that pr- hubris could also be called pride, right? And that pride in your it, it there's a fine line between hubris and pride like it literally can be those, those two words can be used interchangeably in the right circumstances um mm-hmm. and that pride in who the federation is in its idealism is like what makes the federation what it is the true believers you know the problem is sometimes that exact same thing can be its achilles heel and i i, I love that they're they seem to be exploring that uh, actual concept and i hope i hope they continue to i oh yeah i agree like because clearly that's not gonna work out for saru i feel like we're we're gonna find out book should have given him some information yeah for sure especially well this thing he keeps not asking the admiral about some of these things he keeps making these mm-hmm. unilateral decisions like <laughs> you got i feel like i feel like saru does not understand the situation they're in you know yeah He's an older salt. Saru is f- proud of his station, and Saru seems like he's just not quite getting it. Right. It's just, he's, he's leaning on, on certain ideals of the Federation without realizing what helped build the Federation in the first place. Yeah, or, or, or like, you need a dose, to be a good captain, I think you need a dose of pragmatism with your idealism. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that he has that yet. And I think he's going to get it. I think he's working towards it, but I think he's going to make some mistakes along the way. And if he's actually hiding this Kelpian thing because he fears that, you know, they caused the burn or whatever, that's going to be a whole different turn for him. I think, Mm -hmm. especially if he's protocol on everything, except when it's relates to him personally, that's just corrupt, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So those are all the things that happened that didn't really relate to the main plot of this story, which ended up being a lot actually, now that I'm looking at how much we made it through there. Um, but yeah. this, uh, this, this idea that, she, that they're going to save Giorgio this episode, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I liked the, the fact they talked about it. She has the instinct to die in battle. Like once they know they're dying, they just start looking for a battle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, do you want to put that back on your ship? <laughs> you keep that on your ship. Best thing you can do is sedate her. <laughs> um and then there there was a there was a scene where she's trying to drink (laughs) drink the liquid uh drink the keeps trying to pick up the cup and can't with her hand Uh um i've that that reminded me so much of uh edward scissorhands you you remember the scene i'm talking about yes absolutely i know the scene Uh, where he's trying to eat the peas with the scissors Mm -hmm. that scene's always broken my heart yep that whole movie breaks my heart though oh yeah for sure it's like what the like one of the saddest movies I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. Really is. Um anyway, so the the they, they had give her that moment, the Edward Scissorhands moment, but then she immediately turns it and like knocks something onto Tilly and kind of undercuts the whole sadness of the situation. <laughs> yeah, she's a jerk. She really is. Total jerk. Well, she's scared and she's hurting and she doesn't want to admit it. So yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It's like she's an absolute jerk all the time. This is not new, but no. she's you know 
uh, she's, she's lashing out and she's a product of this environment that she's from. And it's, uh, and I, I think it's really interesting seeing her like having lived in this environment for a little while. Now she's going back and you see sort of like what it means to be her, like, like wh- how she's grown and how she's changed. You know? Mm hmm. Mm. I, I like it a lot. And I, I love the goodbye that she gives to Saru and Tilly. She does some sort of goodbye to Saru and then Tilly hugs her. Uh, she, she, Tilly, Tilly says, you've been good for me. Weirdly. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. And then Tilly hugs her and she just sort of pats her on the back uncomfortably. But there seems to be like a genuine look in her eyes like she'll actually miss Tilly. Mm-hmm. Thought that was uh, really well done. And like seeing that she's gone that far to the sort of sentimental and now she's thrown back into the world of uh the the empire you know yeah Ta- the terran empire and then we we get down to the planet uh which mm-hmm. what about this guy in the chair man what, what's up with this chair man uh a chair man um <laughs> we, we don't know this planet from any previous trek do we I, I don't think we do if if i haven't i didn't notice it it's I don't think so. I'll, I can do a quick search on it. Uh, sure, I guess. Danis, uh, Danis five. Uh, do 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 do. What's that? Yeah, what's that no. alpha? Memory alpha. I have to say. I don't know. It's, it's from this episode. Okay, I just didn't know like this being that they encounter. I was curious if it was from a previous trek. It made me think of Q. I feel yeah, like, of dude. course. I saw so many people saying that. So many people said, I wonder, or I saw one guy say specifically, I wonder if Carl is spelled Q-A-R-L. <laughs> <laughs> he also says the word Q in a really weird, he says like Q, I forget what he says. He says some word that has a, has the, the syllable Q in it, and he puts a lot of stank on the word Q, um, or the letter Q or something. I don't know. Oh, I didn't Sorry, even but, notice that. He says like cubic or something like that, but it says like, cubic he says like he said it real i was like mm, you, you giving us clues man <laughs> <laughs> he does look like the q tend to to show up you know like i'm going to show up as a person from earth's past yeah and yeah i mean it seems like he could be a q i i hope he is i hope but he why is. why I, would it be well, you know, whatever. Like, maybe that's the, the thing that this uh, computer knows. Maybe they know that there's a Q that lives on this planet and likes to be visited and help out random people or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's why I was thinking that, that it might be someone from previous Trek, because the computer, uh, the sphere data knowing this planet had some sort of being on it. I just thought maybe mm-hmm. maybe that was from the sphere data. So do you, do you think... Um do you think this is all in Giorgio's mind or do you think because she's clearly if she if she has actually gone back in time to the to her universe like she is probably re, she this is creating another timeline it would be yeah because she has changed shit yeah no I don't think it's real she didn't didn't really change anything until the end there uh, um, she killed Stamets I think that's what was supposed to happen no it wasn't are you sure? Because in, yes, in the prime timeline, he oh, that's wound right. up. You're right. Uh, switching on Lorca. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Or but not, the, not the time see, that prime timeline. Make sense but though, because the original reality. If this was how this all went down before, then he would have tried to kill her. Did she imprison him and have him working for her after he tried to kill her? Or yeah, that that would be weird if that this is how all that went down before and he was still working for her at the palace or whatever. I mean, if they somehow saved him from bleeding out all over the place, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, now, Memory Alpha says that is is different. The, okay. Yeah, I know. And, yeah. and the, definitely at the end, she says for a fact she's deciding to right. change things uh, by not killing Burnham. But yeah, so it says, uh, according to what's past this prologue, Mirror Stamets was initially a member of Lorca's coup, but ultimately betrayed him to Georgiou and was still alive and active aboard the Caron uh, two years later. This episode, Howard depicts him as remaining loyal to Lorca and even making an attempt on Georgiou's life before being killed on the spot. Okay. 
So it's different. Um, so I, I think it's all in her head personally. I think it's all like some, this, this being seems like it's testing her, which also makes me think Q. Um, that's the other reason it, mm-hmm. it makes me think Q is like Q is always testing humanity to see if it's worth living or whatever, or worth surviving. And th- this could be on a personal level, testing Giorgio to see if she's changed uh, adequately for, for this Q to deem her worthy of living. That would be cool. Yeah. I'd be down with that. Like, because so often we've we've said, even on this show, that, like, it doesn't feel like she has been redeemed enough. Like, yeah, we have no, a, this we is that episode, s- man. This is the redeeming episode. They're finally yeah. actually doing the work of, they've let her be on the crew for, like, two years without ever doing the work. <laughs> I mean, she's done the work. We've seen her care some, but for just Burnham, keep up her, de- yeah, but. Only. Well, not only, but more begrudgingly, she cares about other people. And then right. acts like it, it wasn't true. She had her own motives or something. But um Yeah, they it hasn't been enough for sure. <laughs> yeah. They they've not they've not had her do anything to really redeem herself. She's just sort of not enough been to be herself. the head of her own T V show. <laughs> no. No, not at all. And that's yeah, this this episode started to do that work. Like with the with the clear showing the way she feels about um Saru and the way she feels about Tilly and and mm-hmm. you know her complicated relationship with Burnham and sort of like what that needs to be. I, 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 clearly, the complicated relationship with Burnham is 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 the highlight of this episode or like the kind of focus of this episode. She she tells I love the I love the line. She tells um, Burnham, "You have this need to bend people to your will, but unlike unlike my Burnham, you lie about it." <laughs> and, mm-hmm. then, and then she says, "Does all that mean you're coming?" <laughs> <laughs> it's like yep. it's a wonderful line because it's just her not caring about anything she said except for bending her to her will. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> By the way, uh, I do want to point out that uh, Bo Young Kim and Erica Lipolt are, are co-wrote this with Alan uh, McElroy, and uh, Bo Young Kim and Erica Lipolt are the people who are in charge of the Section Thirty One show with her. Oh. Neat. I feel like that's just been a thing for so long and we still haven't gotten like a date or any, I don't I'm know. I'm fine with that. If, if, if what we're doing is just like organically crafting a story with Giorgio. Yeah. And, I totally and developing a section 31 show that we could, you know, enjoy and not feel like it was rushed into production just to, you know, I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't need stuff right the hell now. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, me too. I just it, it just feels I I keep when I when I hear things are in production or like things are an ideas on the table or that's been greenlit or whatever the thing is, and then I mm-hmm. don't get anything for two or three years, I start to be like, is that happening? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's just just force a habit. Too many things that like you hear they're happening, and then two years later you hear, oh yeah, no, that's not happening, and you mm-hmm. sit and wait on it. I don't know. I guess that's what I'm talking about. Um, so he's reading tomorrow's paper, uh, this being mm-hmm. is reading tomorrow's paper and he shows them a door, uh, and he asks, where does it lead? And he said, it doesn't lead. It follows, which makes me think that this is taking whatever she is imagining as mm-hmm. her, I guess her biggest failure, her regret or something like that. It's showing it to her and seeing how she would do things differently. Some, some sort of test like that. That's what yeah. I was, that's what I was talking about earlier. When I say this feels like a classic Star Trek episode, this feels very much like something Kirk would go through or, um, you know, or, or, uh, or, or Picard or whoever. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about what's on that newspaper? Oh, please. I didn't, I didn't pause. I didn't look. What was it? Uh, it is, there's a reference to the Takan supernova from TNG's The Last, the Last Outpost. Uh, they, there's, a, there's a story about the disappearance of the USS Janolan, which was uh, a Scotty ship from Relics. Huh, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was on the Dyson Sphere. And um, there is something about the disappearance of 21st Street Mission from the original series City on the Edge of Forever. That wow. was... Um, Edith Keeler's mission. <laughs> so the disappearance of the mission. That's what it says. Interesting. Here on the on the wiki, I couldn't see it on the on the paper myself. I couldn't either. Well, what do those things have in common, if anything? Um, 
I mean, they're all. Di- what was the first one you said? Uh, the supernova. Well, let's see. Supernova, the disappearance of his ship, and the disappearance of the uh, the mission. The, the, the weird thing is, he he says it's from tomorrow. It's tomorrow's mm-hmm. paper, but this these are things that are sprinkled throughout all time. It seems like. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, the last outpost was uh, Ferengi Marauders. Uh. Enterprise and his quarry become trapped by a mysterious planet that is draining both ships' energy. I remember that. Yeah. I, I mean, they that. may have just picked things right. willy-nilly. It, it may just be. I, I'm just trying to think. Like, I'm wondering if it, there's a way that this all clues into who this guy is. That's but, what, is, that's you know, makes me talking think. about the ancient Takan Empire, this is the first episode that the Fringies show up on, by the way. Yeah, I remember season one of uh, TNG. That's I remember mm-hmm. I was doing my rewatch. That's one of the ones I did rewatch. And uh, there was an actual guardian of the Takan Empire. Now, it's a stretch, but they could be making a Guardian of Forever reference. Yeah, that's what I was about to guess, say. Like the guardian, guardian of Takan, Guardian, Guardian, Con, guardian of Forever. Yeah. Uh, and and if, then, if Relics has any, I don't know if Relics could have anything to do with that. It doesn't, but it does have something to do with time travel, which is kind of, not really, but like you have someone from the original series who was on The Next Generation. That was the Scotty episode. Right. Well, you also um, have time travel in uh, City on the Edge Forever. It exactly. all it all seems kind of related, which makes me wonder if like... Loosely related. If so Let's say this guy who's sitting on this planet now, over the last 900 years, maybe those are things he was somehow involved in or something. Like, if, what if this is a cue... And and this Q has gone around and done some r- random mm-hmm. things throughout the centuries. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, now, I mean, if there is like a test of some sort, because this Guardian, you know, is putting the, the Federation of the Ferengi to the test. Uh, the Guardian of the Edge of Fer- on the Edge of Forever was sort of uh, Kirk going through a test. Uh, you know, will he save the future and give up love or let the woman he loves die? Yeah. Um, you know, and then relics is a little, it's a little tougher to pull out. Yeah. Not really a test. (laughs) Not really a test. Not really. Um, well, okay. Well, it's interesting. We'll see. Nonetheless, we'll see if that all ties. I could totally see them like revealing who he is or something. And then us finding out that he's done some other things or, you know, something like that. Um, Whoever this being is that is sitting on this planet is not exactly a life sign. Mm hmm. Um, okay. So the, the main thrust of this episode past here is um, Georgiou is back with her newfound sort of like Federation ways <laughs> that she's been like infested with. Yeah. And she's trying to live out her days as the Emperor. But in the end, wanting to make a different decision when she's supposed to kill Burnham, which when she sliced mm-hmm. at Burnham and cut partially into her neck, that was pretty badass. Yeah, I dug that a lot. Yeah. So this moment when when she's begging her mother to kill her. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the idea is she was raised by this woman to be yes. this like brutal person. And now this woman has been going soft on her, which, which is interesting. Cause it seems like this is, was happening in the prime in the like regular version of this timeline as well, that Giorgio had already been going softer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, th- or at least perceived was being perceived that way. And now she actually is right. But, um, yeah, I love when she's yelling at her mother to execute her. And it reminded me so much of the Joker and Batman and the mm-hmm. killing joke. Like, because, um, Burnham, uh, Mirror Burnham, mur- Murmur <laughs> is a uh, is laying on it, it, she everything she's been raised to believe this like cutthroat nature of the world is sort of falling down around her, and she would mm-hmm. rather die and have her and be right. You know, she would rather yeah. build the omelet of correctness than. <laughs> In, see how in, see how I help this show. See you, how I you just, aid. You were, you in, were. In, in, in. 
You ever <laughs> just get down on your knees and thank your lucky stars what the, that what the hell? you have access hell, to me I, and my dementia? I made a wonderful callback to your thing, and you're taking credit for it. <laughs> I know. And also, also, using a Seinfeld line to do it. <laughs> you're, nothing, oh. you're nothing but a ball of... Pop culture references, Dave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's better than a smart ball. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> okay. I am Seth MacFarlane without the humor. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, I, I just thought that was fascinating. I thought it was very Batman and the Joker for her to be mm-hmm. begging, begging to be killed because it would it would solidify her worldview she yeah. wants to be better to be right than alive and i just thought that was really well done and felt earned and it really <clears throat> just the insanity of burnham like i want i want a sonequa martin green joker now <laughs> 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 like that it's it, she plays it perfectly i loved it yeah man i i could deal with that dude i could do she could pull it off yeah i think she could I, I you don't we, you don't get to see this unhinged version of Burnham often. We we haven't seen her ever. That's like, true. We we never saw the mirror version of of Burnham. No, and yeah, just like we've seen her upset and pretty, uh, you know, uh, in, in in wild states before, but never just it's completely unhinged like this. And uh, yeah, and we've seen great. Burnham pretend to be the mirror Burnham, but yeah, yeah, it's dope. Yeah, it's it, dope, dude. It was, and I'm, you know, this. What's cool is this episode has basically just showed us with with very few changes what happened during the Lurka coup. Mm-hmm. But like now we, we're going to have this episode two, part two, and it, it looks like it's going to be, you know, what happens now that she's changed something. Like how mm-hmm. could, it, it's kind of a uh, it's a wonderful life sort of thing where like she's made this one change that she wanted to make like what does it mean to her life if she makes that one change you know yeah what will will she be able to bring it, it, the 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 i guess spoiler alert for next uh next uh, the the next time on or whatever but will she be able to bring this world into some sort of harmony with what she thinks the other the uh, is valuable about the other world you know mhm mm. i i found i found it I find it super exciting. Um, and I, I think this episode was sort of just sort of a lot of exposition mm-hmm. for that plot line. But next episode, we're really going to get into the meat of the questions that this being is having her ask, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm digging it. I, I don't mind taking out, taking time out. I don't, um, they're doing a lot of care, uh, uh, important character work. I feel like here. And, um, I I always love character work. I don't get upset about you know filler if there's if it's an important character work because I don't feel like that's filler. Oh yeah, no, I'm with you. I don't I um, don't think this is filler at all. Just because it's not like going directly along the line of you know the burn and all that stuff. I'm like no no this is this is solid. Then we needed we needed this for Georgia. We needed to find out where she stood. We have needed her actual redemption for a very long time. Yeah, and this is this is I think her final season on Discovery, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what I read somewhere at some point. Cool. Um so I think that time is now. If they're yeah. gonna start doing this, this uh, that section thirty one show, and I, I, I am, I'm down for it, man. I, I love the mirror universe. I love mirror universe stuff. Me too. And I think the thing she needs to fully buy into the Federation and like start being an actual good guy is she needs to choose that life, you know. And and mm-hmm. and I think that's what we haven't seen her do. And this episode seems to be her actually choosing that and then seeing. Like maybe seeing the cost of that, and like, mm-hmm. will, she, will she still be, uh, still believe that's the better choice? Um, uh, yeah. Oh, and I really enjoyed her saving Saru's life and all that conversation, and just Mira Saru being um, such a servant and everything. And I remember he, he was in that in the uh, in that last season or season one or whatever too. But I I just mm-hmm. enjoyed seeing him as that just very different character. Yeah. 
And Doug Jones is just class act, man. He does oh, such a good job with for everything. For sure. For sure. Really wonderful. Just fantastic. And you know what? What's up? The answer follows the question. It's dangerous when it goes the other way. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo- I love that line so much. <laughs> it just, it's <laughs> like a, the wisdom of a, of a wise old being and like, just sort of spitting something that seems almost nonsensical, but is clearly not like it's actually very practical advice about paradoxes and stuff like, and time travel and God, I loved it. Yeah, man. It's dangerous when it goes the other way, but it like in such plain speech, you know, this is my kind of episode, man. I liked it a lot. Yeah, man. I did too. I enjoyed it. There has not been an episode of the season yet that I haven't been like fully on board with. So I, I agree. And, you know, I'm I'm excited this is episode nine. I'm excited next week's episode, you know, 10. And that's going to wrap up this terra firma storyline. And then we're just going to have three more episodes to wrap the season. And um, I, 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 I'm, I'm of two minds because I have really loved this season. And I want more than 13 episodes. And I'm shocked because I never want more than 13 episodes. <laughs> yeah, of Discovery. It's always like, we're at the end of the season. I feel I feel sated. I'm pretty good. Yeah, I mean, well, I for any show, I generally go 13. They could have done it in eight. <laughs> there are just so many shows. And especially now, there are so many shows. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, up to the ante. Right. But, uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <sighs> gave me so much Star Wars homework. Yeah, for sure. Have you been watching The Mandalorian? No. <laughs> oh, it's good. Mandalorian's no. good. I I jumped into The Mandalorian. I part of me wanted to go back and watch all the other stuff I haven't seen, like Clone Wars and all that. And I tried. I just couldn't get into it. And I was like, you know what? I'm just watching Mandalorian, and it's been good. And I don't feel like I need anything else. And over on Star Wars Universe podcast, our little sister uh, sister rival show there. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's no rivalry. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, yeah. but uh they they're they're doing some primers where they just do like this character showing up on uh you know uh, this character showed up on mandalorian this is who they are and we're going to give you like a quick episode primer on who is osaka or whatever and who is this yeah. and who is bo and who is it's just, it's neat i'm 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 excited for those episodes I was um I was talking to our listener and my friend Jason Smith. And, <laughs> I, like uh, I was talking to our listener, the one. <laughs> <laughs> Just full stop. No, uh, no, uh, my friend and our listener Jason Smith. Yes, I know him. Put it that way. You know him. Yes. And he was like, "Oh man, so much Star Wars, so much Marvel." You know, and I, I think he was feeling about Marvel overwhelmed, like I was about Star Wars. And he was, I was like, man, I'm just so overwhelmed with all the Star Wars stuff. And he said, oh, really? Because I'm overwhelmed with the Marvel stuff. And I was like, yeah, but Marvel has never really bored me. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, he was like, I was like, man, if I had, if I watch Mandalorian and now they've got the Rosario Dawson spinoff. And I'm so pumped for that. I I just love Rosario Dawson so much. I do too. And you know, I was like, man, I I'm gonna wind up having to watch freaking Clone Wars and he was like, Well yeah, you're gonna have to watch Clone Wars and Rebels because her yeah. yeah, her 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 storyline goes over there too. And uh, I'm like, you, you know you're making it harder. You're mm-hmm. you're making me less interested. Dude, like, the, the that one screenshot so of much. That one screenshot of the head of whatever Disney or the head of uh, Star Wars. I don't know who, who is. Who, I didn't watch that one, so I don't even know who it's going. Anyway, yeah. it's like them standing in front of a board with all the shows they have coming. And uh-huh. it's like 15 shows. And they're, they've they only got one on the air right now. Like, it's such a big, like, swing. Like, such a big call your yeah. shot moment. Um, uh, similar to what they did uh, six years ago with... Um, the El Capitan theater for Marvel, where they were like, here's our next, you know, six years of movies. And then they tried to execute that. Did you, did you see the Patty Jenkins thing? Uh, which thing? Uh, where she is like skating and talking about, Oh yeah. Being a fighter pilot and then goes yeah, to the rogue squadron then, trailer. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So basically 
at the end of this Jason Smith conversation, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm out. I'm not watching Star Wars. I'm probably never going to watch any of this shit. <laughs> I, I can't do it. There's too much stuff. I haven't, still haven't watched Rogue One. I think you just need to get yourself into the mindset of, I, I you know, I just watch, watch Star Wars I want to watch. <laughs> right. And I'm, I, I'm not that person. I never have been either. I've always been a completist. But... I now am that with Star Wars, and I'm pretty happy mm-hmm. with it because I ju- you just can't be a completist with everything these days. Like you got to pick your pick your battles, pick your pick your maybe. things you're going to be the f- biggest fan of. You know, maybe right. and maybe one day you'll have time to go back and watch everything and start. But like I just think if I could just get done with this damn Netflix Marvel shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, even with that like i love i i love that stuff but i would say pick your pick your battles with that like yeah. i'd if you want but, to um, as as the marvel cinematic universe podcast guy i give you full uh I, I i absolve you of your sins of skipping iron fist um it's, it is too, like. it's, it's too bad you're not an authority over my completest nature <laughs> Um, but no, I, so yeah, I, I told Jason, I was like, man, I don't think I'm, I'm ever going to watch any of this stuff. I mean, who knows? I, you know, I was playful about it though. I was like, yeah, I said, you know, man, and I said, this is me today. Who knows? Maybe tomorrow, uh, a, a mood will strike me down and I shall become more powerful than you ever imagined. <laughs> and, uh. And then I sat down and I was kind of screwing around, just kind of looking at some of the stuff that came out. And I had not watched the Patty Jenkins teaser thing yet. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, we'll see this. And she's like skating along, talking about like waking up to like go watch her dad take off. And, sh- and oh my God. And then she mm-hmm. talks about how he lost his life and how she's been wanting to make a real fighter pilot movie. And then like when she puts on that flipping helmet, and that, like, mm-hmm. I had a tear in my eye as she's, like, walking towards the freaking X-Wing. Yeah. And I texted him immediately. I'm like, just saw the Patty Jenkins thing. I think I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> like, it takes, it's so little. There's it's so little to pull me back in. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think it was the dad thing. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really um, beautiful beautiful little vignette there yeah so i don't know we'll we'll, we'll see it, it's it's not a priority is it's never going to be a priority of star wars so um you know my wife is what is is current on mandalorian and uh i have not watched it with her and uh i was really psyched for it and you know jason also even pointed out to me like dude you like westerns you're gonna dig mandalorian and that, and that's probably true um, like every complaint my wife has about Mandalorian makes me want to watch it. <laughs> what are her complaints it's, that make you want to watch it? It's too, it's too slow. It's too boring. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what you say about Westerns. That's what you say about Citizen Kane. This sounds like it's perfect for me. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> like, we watched the trailer to, uh, to, to Mank, you know, uh, <laughs> about the writer of Citizen Kane. And she was just like, that looks gorgeous. But boring. I am not watching that. And I was like, man, that's all I want to watch right now. <laughs> my problem with the first season of Mandalorian, and I, I've really enjoyed mm-hmm. the second season, but my f- problem with the first season is I didn't feel invested at all. And like, you know, Baby Yoda is real cute and all, but like. Yeah, it's been like the biggest detriment to me <laughs> is, is seeing that shit all over social media. Baby Yoda is real cute. And, and but it just doesn't make me love the character. Uh, mm-hmm. of either of these characters mm-hmm. so like i find myself um like i i I felt i felt this way in the first episode and it kind of never went away for the whole first season it was like the only reason people love this is because it's star wars you know what i mean mm-hmm. like it, it it really took me a whole season like the last couple episodes of the season i finally was like oh i'm starting to get the mandalorian's character and care about him as like his own thing and not just like I felt like everyone else I felt like most of the people that I know who absolutely loved the first season were like it's 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 amazing did you see they reference this or that and I'm like I get why that's cool because I, I I watch Star Trek and I have the same feelings when they do that on Star Trek but like I'm not a big Star Wars fan so like none of that really I just don't care I just don't care about it and like I found myself in that first episode just being like 
I just don't care. I think like a big part of the problem is you never see his face, which is very mm-hmm. cool and experimental. Um, but like he doesn't take his helmet off is, is a big part of the show. Uh, that's part of his religion is he doesn't take his helmet off. Mm-hmm. And so like, by stinks in there. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Um, but it's really hard to connect with that character. But I guess if you grew up on star Wars and Boba Fett toys, then it's mm-hmm. like that helmet means everything to you. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm crazy. Um, I don't know. Some people, I mean, I'll, I'll think I watch it one day. Yeah, it's it's definitely worth a watch. And season two, I've really enjoyed. Once I got to where I did care about his character, I actually, yeah. I think I saw like maybe it was movies with Mikey or, or someone did a uh, like an essay on it and why it's so good. And actually, mm-hmm. like really kind of won me over. Honestly, like I I honestly okay. like the Clone Wars and and Rebels uh, have been so so lauded by by fans of Star Wars. And, you know, Jason Smith was telling me that he feels like it's Star Wars works better as television than than it does as a movie. And, you know, I haven't watched Rogue One I, and I haven't seen Solo and I haven't seen Rise of Skywalker. I need to get to those things as well. And um, but The Last Jedi was my favorite Star Wars movie. So I don't think I'm a real Star Wars fan anyway. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we're not the same kinds of Star Wars fans. You made that really good joke about a uh, like, you know. Uh, strike me down and I'll fall. Right. Like, uh, it's, it's really good. I, like I know star Wars pretty well. It's just, it was never my fandom. And it's just really funny when I talk to people and like, <laughs> I was in the car with my, uh, my bandmates and they all like star Wars. I feel like star Wars is, there's a lot more casuals of star Wars. There's a lot more filthy casuals mm-hmm. that just like, like star Wars. Cause it's laser fights. But and, that's not who I am either though. No, no, no. I know. Um, so even things that I'm not really that into, I know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, well, maybe not, uh, not everyone, but generally. <laughs> it's just, uh, but uh, I, I thought it was really funny. We were talking about um, we were in the car uh, going to a gig or whatever, and mm-hmm. and my friends, uh, my bandmates are all like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really cool. It happens like, and they start talking about the time period that it happens in, and they and they're saying it happens before A New Hope, Ugh. Mandalorian. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I was like, no. Did you not catch the conversation about how Imperial credits are no longer worth anything? And, and I was just like, went, went on this whole spiel about all the reasons, all the little like hints that they drop in the first episode as to where it's placed mm-hmm. in the timeline. <laughs> and my bandmates were like, we thought you weren't a Star Wars fan, and I was like, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I hear that all the time. I hear it all the time. Like, we we had an eighty. I was just talking to somebody. We had. I was talking to this, about this to uh, my sister in law, uh, who lives in Japan. We were we were just talking, and I was uh, talking about how like I'm not a Star Wars fan, but I did beat my other sister in law at Star Wars trivia. And it, <laughs> I didn't win that night. Someone else won. But I at least got more points than my sister-in-law <laughs> who lives here. And I was beyond pleased. That's how petty I am. <laughs> she's very like, I know a lot about Star Wars. I love Star Wars. You're not a Star Wars fan. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Yeah. But I w- still beat you. Oh, man. They're like, like cause, and we had that like bit or like a few times. She's like, you're not supposed to be a Star Wars fan. You're not supposed to know that. And I'm like, and yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any feedback? Sure, we do. Well, we just um, get to that because we've been going quite a while. Yeah, and I know. We I got know. off Star Trek a long time ago. But I'm cool. I know we did. It's, it's all good. It's all good, baby. You know, it, there, there's a great uh, Shatner interview on Conan where he accidentally calls Star Trek Star Wars. Uh, and everyone boos. And uh, playfully. And he goes, we can share. The universe is vast. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> it's one of my favorite interviews. And uh, yeah. Anyway, Stu Little wants to know, uh, why aren't they using trans warp beaming? Scotty Prime supposedly invented it before the Romulan supernova. Um, well, it was never completely stable. We can say that. You can always come up with some reason they wouldn't be using I it anymore. Transwarp beaming is just the thing. Are you, are you talking about the thing from 2009 Star Trek where Scotty uh, yeah, beams he says them he, onto the the 
the the ship while it's in warp. Yes. Yeah, yes. but that just beams you onto a ship while it's at warp. It doesn't necessarily. Uh, yeah, but um, Khan used it in this in Star Trek Into Darkness to get to uh, Kronos. Okay, they used it quite a bit. So it just gets you around. It like gets you further. Uh, I mean, it is literally he's beaming that you can use you can beam from a ship that is warping to another ship that is warping or right. to a planet from a warping ship yes yeah so it, it just has to do with warp i think what he he may be asking here is why aren't they using it as a source of travel right that's what they're saying that's what he's asking Which is, yeah but I, I don't it doesn't really necessarily it doesn't necessarily expand the range of a transporter right it's, it absolutely does i guess it would have to to some degree but like i thought it was just to get to one and who that is at warp that was the whole idea. At least that's how they described it in 2009 Star Trek. We we don't know how perfected it was in the prime timeline, for one thing. In the 23rd century, we knew that no, Khan, what, sorry, in the 2009, the Kelvin verse, Khan was a, an operative of Section 31, who might have ha- might have taken Scotty's formula uh, that Spock Prime gave him and uh, re-engineered it so that it was even more effective or that or they may have figured out a way because remember kelvin verse timeline was more technologically advanced way more tech like augmented beyond augmented because of their 24th century their late 24th century incursion right so and their uh fear of the future or whatever and and then the attack of it on the narada so like of the narada so they also like yes it, they get all militaristic and build bigger ships and faster ships and better weapons um you know in fact cons um implementation of 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 it seemed to be much more precise than what scotty pulled off in the first 2009 movie when you know he he kind of just showed up in strange places in in the engine room so you know there's a whole lot to be said and i mean uh, for that matter why aren't why didn't anyone in next generation use the the uh the force field belts that they used in the animated series (laughs) i mean right there are all sorts of reasons you you might look at a piece of technology and go oh that causes cancer later or oh don't we're no that's doing something wrong yeah, you know don't we can't use that anymore for whatever reason there might be some reason we don't know and we know the real reason is it is it doesn't work and it makes the spore drive it makes the whole season not work honestly if they were trying to use that i still say that we don't really from from what they said in the 2009 movie that's just like it's just the ability to beam onto a ship at warp. It doesn't necessarily give you the ability to beam anywhere in the galaxy or whatever. I don't believe. No, not necessarily. So like, it's not necessarily a great form of travel. It's just a, another a way to get onto a warping ship. And there was also Kurtzman mentioned eh, sort of in an apocryphal uh, way. I think there was maybe even a book or something that said it, but um, the reason it didn't work for the USS Vengeance in Star Trek Into Darkness was because it had some sort of anti-transwarp beaming tech on it that dampened it, and you couldn't do it. So, you uh, know, they, if 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 that was a, if it became a real thing, they probably <laughs> they learned to defend against it. Yeah, or whatever. Sure, yeah, sure basically. Thing. Yep, we can headcanon all of that all day. Oh yeah, or. There's always the fun the possibility that due to the temporal wars, Scotty never invented it. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Stu goes on to say uh, that holodeck program from will always have Paris <laughs> 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 ought to at least raise some red flags about privacy in the Federation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Privacy has gone. But, dude, we have Facebook. I already thought it was. Yeah. Privacy is already gone. <laughs> yeah. I feel I could hear, I can literally hear Picard in my head go, uh, in the future, we have evolved beyond the need for privacy. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, which makes sense. If no one judges you for being fat or bald or whatever the hell they are in the future, because we're also evolved. Who the hell cares what you do in your spare time? Unless you're Barkley. And then they're like, stop recreating me in the holodeck. You pervert. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, there's still there's still different reasons people might want privacy, but yeah, true. Yeah. I think they have it in their like quarters and stuff. I guess. I would assume. I don't know. They do all kinds of like recreations. <laughs> yeah, they do. 
Um, <laughs> there is also, uh, he says there also the question of why Picard was the only French person in that scene without a French accent. <laughs> That's always been the question, man. We don't ever know. No, like he's talking to his French brother. <laughs> now he, he's just got his like universal translator set mm. to be really pretentious. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I've never thought about that, but that is perfect. I love that idea. I love that head cannon. The card. You know what? When he was when he was a when he was a youth, he yep. went through a punk phase and wanted to be British. Yep. He got for sure. he got mayhem tattooed on his stomach. <laughs> Dyed his hair blue and changed the Universal Translator to sound British. And the only thing he kept was the yep. British accent because he just liked it he, so he much. He found it really like worked with the ladies or something. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, little Trank says a solid episode. I love the mirror verse. I love watching the actors ham it up. I think though, I'm going to wish this was a single episode and not a two parter. I just don't want to spend two episodes on a side quest to save Giorgio. I'm, I'm, I don't think that's what we're doing. I think we're leading up to this section 31 show and we need that redemption. Yeah, I think that, but also I I do feel that as I mentioned earlier, this episode was about this kind of cool thing of like looking back on what happened, what happened when Lorca revolted. And I thought that was Mm -hmm. a really cool little, like this is just a snapshot of what happened with like her reliving it. Kind of like that Odo episode where he goes back and relives you know, what I'm talking about like the prisoners, the four prisoners that yep. he executed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, this was this was similar to that, but I think this next episode is going to be about like what happens when you change something, and it'll be much more like I don't know. I guess what a war- uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what what's the fucking Jimmy Stewart movie? For what a wonderful world! It's a what? It's a wonderful life. Thank you. <laughs> what a wonderful world and we said it earlier i said it earlier and had no problem and now my brain just won't come up with it uh yeah it's wonder- like i think we're gonna get that more like it's a wonderful life feel where she's changed something what does that mean and i i don't know are we gonna get a, is it still gonna be cutting back and forth between the ship and her like weird side quest thing and how, what's, the, what's the balance going to be like there? Who is this being? That's the stuff I'm interested in. So I, I still yeah. feel like there's a lot to tell here, but I, I guess yeah. I, I see what he's, where he's coming from. But I, um, if, I guess if they had just done her side quest and not mm-hmm. done anything else, they could have fit it all into one maybe, but they did a lot of other little things this episode. Yep. A uh, little Trank also says, it looks like Giorgio has created another timeline. I'm not sure how this is going to cure her problem. Well, if it's a test by a Q, uh, maybe by destroying slash rewriting her timeline, she will fall into phase with the prime timeline. And that dude is the hat. A uh, dude, dude with the hat is a Q, right? Yeah, man, I think so. <laughs> or at the very least, like a Trelane type of character who may or may not be a Q, depending on what, you know, extended universe novel you pick up. Either way, weird God figure, dude, current trick doesn't really leave a lot of room for extended universe, you know, fan wink. Because they just kind of throw it in for the, themselves because all the writers are fans. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, ah, it's probably going to wind up being a queue. And I would imagine it is not another timeline. I, I like Matt's theory that is the test. Um, yeah. It does feel very queue. It, it, it feels and, like a test. And the fact they keep jumping back and forth between that, uh, the, this test that she's going through and the, um, the ship make me think it's all in the same timeline. Cause I feel like if they had actually, I don't, I don't think she's created a new timeline. I think it's just a, it's like a sim a, for all intents and purposes, a simulation mm-hmm. of what would have happened, but who knows? I don't know. I, I don't mind that if it, cause I, I guess I don't mind that normally I don't like that when they, you get to the end and it was all a simulation, but like, I guess yeah. I'd never thought it was real. <laughs> so like, yeah. it doesn't bother me that it would be. Yeah, I mean, you better get used to it because, you know, they're saying that there's at least a 50% probability that the life that we are currently living is a simulation. That's true. That's true. They actually, it was, yeah. I think it's actually much higher than that. I think it's like they think it's almost a near certainty that it is. <laughs> um, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's all simulation, man. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. No, we've already talked about Star Wars. You want to get into simulation theory now? <laughs> what's that? What's the game that they play? Roy on a 
Rick yes. and Morty <laughs> play Roy. <laughs> we're all just a, we're I've, all just Roy, man. Oh, that yeah, that would make sense because I've never been good at video games. <laughs> Um, now, last week, we've talked about what we we're going to do at the end of this discovery run. And we talked about uh, running back and doing some T- talking about some TOS episodes, uh, maybe doing like a top five and then getting to a breakdown of the original series films. Dave Miller over on YouTube says, I would definitely love to hear your breakdown of the original series films. Wrath of Khan is my personal favorite. As for my top original series episodes. City on the Edge of Forever, Mirror, Mirror, The Devil in the Dark, Arena, and The Doomsday Machine. Take care, guys. Keep up the awesome content. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, and you guys, all you other people, better get on the, all you other one listener, should better get on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Smith, you're the only other one, even though Stu and Little Trank listen, clearly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll better get on the ball and give us your top five episodes i've already gotten mine written down of course i've got like a top 10 yeah dude i got and, my, i got um, mine unlocked I'm, Box I am brain. Scru- uh, oh god um no no <laughs> <laughs> the empath <laughs> <laughs> that one where sulu runs around with his shirt off with the sword hey man uh, that's the naked time that's a pretty good one <laughs> okay i just was trying to think of silly shots from his the, hand oh it's hammy the little, it's little hammy, hammy episodes, episodes. um <laughs> <laughs> it's a hammy yeah this oof but it's a pretty good one sweet I it's it. not in my top 10 <laughs> <laughs> it's not my top five or ten yeah I, I i don't know man i don't know all right so any uh any other big things any other any other feedbacks i was about to say just my swinging cod no <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, uh, no, nah, nah, we don't. We don't have anything. Well, uh, yeah, log those f- top five there, and we'll come up with ours, the ones that we can re- think of. You, I, you can clearly have your five. Yeah, well, no, I can give a ten. That's what I can give right now. All um, right. Oh, you kind of narrow it still. I still got to narrow it. I'm, I, I'll I do, have love, man. I I'll do love the same. Hard. I'll do the same. I'll try to try to. I'll try to actually rem- think back and look look through some lists and figure out what my favorites that I remember. I, <laughs> I love. Um, see on the edge of forever. I know that it's considered one of the best. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, that generally is considered the best episode. Right. Yeah. I love it, but I also find it to be n- not a very um, part of what makes it so sp- so special is that it's so special. If that makes mm-hmm. sense, like it's not very representative of the whole. Which is, I don't know. Thinking about what we should do as a top five, like I want to do some of the best episodes, but I also want to do th- something sort of representative of what, like if you, I, I, if we were introducing people to TOS, like what would those five episodes be? Right. Like, I, I think I disagree. I think it is very representative of, of the whole of what Star Trek is about, about personal sacrifice and about the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few or the one. Um, yeah. And I think Edith Keeler is a perfect representative in her time of what the Federation stands for and what the, the ideals of uh, the of Starfleet and the Federation are, and I think she would approve of of their decision to uh, let her pass for the good of mankind. And uh, I don't know. I think it. I think it does represent the overall philosophy of Star Trek. Yeah, very well. I, I agree with that. Um, I don't. I don't disagree with that philosophy side. But I do. Th- I guess I mean like the actual, uh, more like the bones of the episode. Like what is. What's going? On? I mean, it, no, it, Bones was in it. Yeah, but he's remember he's, he got. He, but he's he not. He's not. Like, he's not the Bones we know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> we were both going for the same joke. <laughs> Murderers, assassins. <laughs> <laughs> so very different Bones. Very different Bones in that episode. Um, yeah. All right. Anyway, well, that's that's about all from us, I guess. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening, everybody. Man, we are we are hitting like <laughs> an hour. And a, I'm just looking. I'm looking. It's like a, we, record, we record these things in the middle of the night most of the time. It's like one in the morning, and uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're at an hour and a half. I'm like, dang, that's two weeks in a row we've hit near an hour and a half. Uh, I'm just enjoying these episodes. I'm enjoying chatting about them. Yeah, man, I'm, I am too. And uh, you know, we, we went off on a Star Wars tangent, and that's okay. That we did. That we did. Um, Hope you guys enjoy the 20 minutes of Star Wars 
discussion in the middle of the Star Trek. We're talking about how we don't like Star Wars. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We don't like it, but we know way more than we want to. Mm -hmm. I've literally got a Luke Skywalker action figure like a foot away from me. All right. You just have a problem. Um, I do have a problem. (laughs) All right, Dave. Thanks for doing the cast with me tonight. You guys have a good one. Uh, Joel on True. Take is eternal. I'm going back to that. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 